Well, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of familiar faces, but if you're new to us, conservation, adventure, and science is what we bring into classrooms every single day. If you're joining us again during this epic If Then series, you will know that we spend the entire month of February showcasing solely the most amazing women in science and exploration around planet Earth. And we are so thrilled to be partnering with If Then for this incredible week. We've got 16 broadcasts with their ambassadors. So they went a few years back and picked some of the most incredible people ever. And we are privileged to get to feature 16 of them over this week. Everything from cave divers, photographers, archaeologists, archaeologists, neuroscientists, and more. It's been a wild ride. Everything is on our YouTube channel if you want to check out all the other programs. And again, you can see them all on our little webpage around this series as well. Now today, before I dive in with our speaker, I want to note we are going to have a Kahoot together. So if you're new to Kahoot's uh, four-question quiz between our talk and our Q&A, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun. If you want to bring up that game pin, we'll be doing that in about 25 minutes. Now, I'm so thrilled today because we're going in on one of my all-time favorite topics, and that is bugs. Dr. Rhonda Hamm is going to be our guide today to take us from fear to fascination. A lot of us are kind of scared about spiders and centipedes and even other insects uh, or insects of all kinds, but today we're going to learn to appreciate them a little bit more. They're certainly one of my favorite group of creatures, and they're everywhere. If you go out on your side, walk or if you go out in your backyard front yard walk around your house you will see insects arachnids arthropods of all kinds and so we're going to learn a little bit more about these amazing creatures i'm so excited for you to meet dr Rhonda. and without further ado welcome to the broadcast for the first time hello hi everyone thank you for being here i'm super excited to be here you have a lot to share with us, I know. So I'm going to stop talking myself, put myself in the background, and leave you to blow our minds over the next 20 minutes or so and to take us from fear to fascination. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for being here. I am super excited to share a little bit about my journey. And I actually, if any of you out there are kind of scared about this topic um, and insects are not your favorite thing, it's okay because I was exactly like you. I actually was terrified of them when I was younger and I had to develop an appreciation and an understanding and realize what they did and why they were important. And then they became less scary and more fascinating to me. So I'm going to share some of my journey and the different things that you can do with insects because most people just look at these random little things on the sidewalk and sometimes they squish them while they walk by and sometimes they say, oh, look, there's an insect and we'll keep walking. And very few of us actually stop to take a really deep look at them and understand like what are they doing and why are they important and why are they even here what is it about this sidewalk that they want to be on um and so we're going to talk a little bit about kind of a journey um my journey and adventure with insects so without further ado hopefully my slides are showing and that this will work yes excellent so i am originally from fresno california i hear that there are some people from fresno joining us today so shout out to you all um, I am part of uh, Central High School, and I went to um, elementary school at McKinley Elementary School. So if you are in that Central District, um, I am proud to represent you these days in my career and where I've gone. So I started out there. That's my hometown. That's where I went to school. I did um, my bachelor's degree actually in agricultural education at Fresno State University. So I stayed in my hometown for university. But then I decided to continue my education. And so I wanted to get a master's degree um, and I wanted to do that in entomology because I had started out in high school working in an entomology lab and learned more about these amazing creatures. And so I moved from Fresno all the way across the country to upstate New York. And I went to Cornell University and got a master's and a PhD in entomology from Cornell. And then when I was looking for a job, I was hired by a company in Indiana. And so I moved to Indiana, which is where I'm calling you from today, just outside of Indianapolis, Indiana. And so kind of have an opportunity to travel and do a lot of things. I This is where I've actually lived, but I've done some other traveling, which I'll talk about a little bit as I go through my story. So I wanted to tell you about my career adventure in entomology and all the different types of science that are wrapped up in entomology. And so I'm going to break it down a little bit into kind of the, the fields and the environments that I worked in. So the first one I'm going to talk about is laboratory research. So I worked in a laboratory like you might see in your science lab. So if you go to high school and you're in a high school science lab, it might look a little bit like this picture down here. This is actually a college science lab. Um, and there I'm doing some teaching um, and helping these students learn how to 
determine what kinds of insects they have um, that they're looking at. And so um, I studied in the laboratory, kind of like that with microscopes. I spent a lot of time at a microscope looking at all these amazing creatures right here. And so these are all houseflies. That's what my master's and my PhD focused on is houseflies. And you notice that they all look kind of odd. Some are black, some are brown, some have yellow eyes, some have red eyes or dark colored eyes. Some of them have really strange looking wings. Well, this is all genetics. And so I used some genetics or what is called phenotypes. So phenotypes are the, the physical characteristics I can see, like that brown body or that black body or those yellow eyes. Those are things that I can actually see. Those are linked to the genetics. And so I used those to determine some characteristics about those flies. And so that was part of what I did. Um, and that's genetics. I also did some molecular biology. So this right here is, I would squish up the flies and extract their DNA and then look for specific genes that were in that fly. And so that's what this tells me. Um, and then this is just a representation of some of the genetics that I worked on, but you can do all kinds of different things. I studied in the laboratory, everything from insect behavior to biological control. And that's actually using one insect against another insect. So you basically battle them together. So if you like, you know, putting a spider and a fly together to see if the, to watch the spider eat it. You can actually do that in real life. Um, but my biological control, I was actually using a wasp and a caterpillar and that wasp would sting the caterpillar and then lay its eggs on that caterpillar. Um, and so that's the biological control that I was working on. Um, and then I also worked with urban pests, which are things like termites and cockroaches. So I did all of that in the laboratory and setting up different types of studies to ask really cool, interesting questions. So that's one environment that I've worked in. The other environments that I've worked in is I've been a teacher and educator. So doing things like this, I love doing things like this. And so I've done that. I've also done some insect rearing. So this picture down here is what a chamber of raising houseflies looks like. So these containers here are full of what we call maggots or the baby houseflies. They're in this meal. Um, they basically float around and dig around in their food and so then they pupate and the adult flies emerge and we put them into these cages that are behind me here. So that's where the flies are actually flying around and mating and laying their eggs is inside there. So I did a lot of that for a number of different species, everything from moths to flies to um, stink bugs um, to bed bugs, all kinds of different things I've reared. And then the other thing that's been super fun and cool that I've done is I have worked in field research. And so field research takes me to all kinds of cool places. And so I've done field research in crops. So you see this bottom picture here of me, this is soybeans. Um, I've been doing some counts of the plants and the number of insects on those, but I've worked in trees and vines and all kinds of different crops. This picture up here actually is me standing in um, where the cattle food kind of is. And there are house flies all over here. So I'm actually collecting house flies. This one's super interesting and fun. Why would the Statue of Liberty have anything to do with entomology? It's a great, great fun question to answer. So this is actually one of my field sites that I had when I was doing urban pest. So the statue itself is bronze, right? And so termites aren't gonna like to eat that. But can you think of what termites do like to eat? Give you a second to think about it. Hmm, we could actually bring in class with Rhonda if you'd Ooh, like. What do, you, what do termites like to eat? Yeah, Miss Barras class, what do you guys think? What? 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 Yes, I think that might be correct, Rhonda. That <laughs> is absolutely correct. You are correct. And so this pedestal part that she stands on, the Statue of Liberty is on, is actually there's wooden structures in here. And so termites were eating the base of the Statue of Liberty. So my job was to go and make sure that those termites couldn't damage the Statue of Liberty. Talk about super cool field site. I got to go out there when no one else was out there, only the employees were out there to inspect those termite bait stations. Um, so then I've also done some biotechnology. So the crops that are protected with the genetics inside the crop from insect damage. And I've also done science communication. So how do we talk about what the science is and why it's important and why all these cool things are happening and we're discovering these. And sometimes you can be standing in a big pile of stuff that smells kind of bad 
And this field site actually is in Australia. So I got to travel to Australia and you look up and in that same barn where it's pretty smelly are these amazing, beautiful birds. And so sometimes you get a little bonus perk in biology when working in entomology. So I was collecting flies. These beautiful birds showed up and were just kind of my neighbors um, while I was out doing my field work. So I want to talk now about how insects grow. And there's really two ways. One way you might be familiar with and the other way might maybe, maybe not. And so the first way is called incomplete metamorphosis. And so essentially you have three stages. You have the egg, the nymphs, which usually there's more than one nymphal stage um, for a lot of insects, anywhere from two to four to five. Um, and then they molt into the adult. And so when they molt, that means they shed their exoskeletons to continue to grow. So their skeleton is on the outside, whereas our skeleton is on the inside, right? So as we grow, our body kind of stretches out with us. They can't do that. It's like trying to put on your little sister or brother's clothes and they're just too tight. And so you kind of rip them. But that's essentially what happens with the exoskeleton is it kind of gets too tight. And in order to grow, they have to shed that. And so that is what um, one way that insects grow is through the egg, nymph, and adult stage. And really, a lot of times, the only way to tell the difference between nymphs and adults is if they develop wings. So like in a grasshopper or a cricket, nymphs will not have wings, but the adults will have wings. So that's a good little indication of what stage you might be looking at when you see these, because they just look like miniature ones of the adult. The other way that you might be even more familiar with, because maybe you've done this in your class by raising some butterflies or caterpillars, um, is complete metamorphosis. And that's where you have an egg, a larva, a pupa, and an adult. So the larva can also be called a caterpillar, and the pupa can also be known as a cocoon. Um, but even within the cocoon is a pupa. So usually we refer to that as a pupa. And so those are things like beetles and the flies that I just talked about that I reared um, and butterflies and bees and wasps, they all go through this complete metamorphosis where they have those four distinct life stages. Sometimes they'll eat completely different things. So if you think about a caterpillar that's maybe munching on a tomato plant, once it pupates, it actually changes its mouth parts all together and becomes a butterfly or a moth. And that has a totally different mouth part. And so their body shapes change, lots change during that sort of pupil stage. They reorganize their whole body plan and they emerge as this adult that looks very different from what their younger one looked like. Um, so those are two, two types of ways that insects grow. So I mentioned a little bit about mouth parts in the last example, and there are a number of different types of mouth parts depending on the type of insect that you're looking at. So chewing mouth parts have mandibles that chew and so they consume and you can see chew marks in leaves and such. So if you see that, those are probably caterpillars that are doing that, maybe a beetle that's doing that. They all have chewing mouth parts. And so I go like this because that's how they chew. They have these mandibles that chew kind of this way. Um, and then we have, oh, there we go, chew, chew, chew. So they've got mandibles that crunch. The next one that you probably are all familiar with and you probably don't like, I don't really like them much either, um, are piercing sucking mouth parts. And those are things like mosquitoes. So if you get a mosquito bite and it gets kind of red and itchy, it's because that piercing sucking mouth part bit you um, and pierced your skin and started sucking your blood. Um, and then just fun fact while we're at it, mosquitoes, do you know that it's only the female mosquito that bites you? The male mosquitoes don't bite people. They don't actually need a blood meal. The only reason that they're, those females are biting us and taking our blood is because that's how they produce their eggs. And so males, no eggs, no need to suck blood. And so it's only the females that are actually doing that for us um, and to us. <laughs> and then another one, another type of mouth part is siphoning. And so that's basically a really long straw. It's usually curled up um, and butterflies and moths will extend that to help them drink nectar from flowers. And then the final one is from my favorite, the housefly, and that is a sponging mouth part. Think of like a straw with a sponge on the end of it. And so they put that sponge onto liquid stuff to soak it up and then they drink it up. So the sponge sort of soaks it up and then it goes through the tube and that's how they're actually consuming. So they have sponging mouth parts. 
So those are all the different types of mouth parts that insects have. So now I'm going to talk about some insects and just specific little like categories that I made up. So I'm going to talk about some really useful ones. And I was super fun to have a poop emoji in a presentation. I'm just going to say. So I have my poop emoji here because we would be covered. This planet would be covered in poo if we did not have insects that were recycling some of that for us. And so right here you see a dung beetle. These dung beetles actually roll these cute little balls of poo into the ground. They lay their eggs on them. And those little larvae, remember, they have that complete metamorphosis, will consume the poo for us. So I am super thankful that these creatures exist on the planet because it keeps our planet clean. The other one, um, and this one is, has an interesting story because they are super useful in some situations and they are terrible in others. And so that's a great example of looking at insects and saying, when are they a pest and when are they beneficial? And so termites, that's what you're seeing here. This is actually a termite queen. So she's the one that's laying the eggs and producing all the babies. This is a worker whose sole job is to keep the queen and the colony fed. Um, and then there's another one that I didn't find a picture of that's called a soldier. They have these really big mandibles. Remember, we just talked about what those mandibles look like. And those big giant mandibles are for protection. They're called soldiers. And that's what they do is any threat to the colony, they use those big mandibles to go and bite whatever it is so that it can't attack their colony and their queen. And so termites are super useful in the forest where they're breaking down cellulose. So you mentioned that they consume wood and trees fall over in the forest all the time. And they might just sit there and slowly decompose um, under different circumstances. But termites can help with that decomposition um, in a rapid way. So in those scenarios, they can be beneficial. But in another scenario, like we talked about with the Statue of Liberty, right, they're a pest. And so we have to do something to control them, make sure that they don't damage our homes or damage our crops or the trees that we're trying to protect that are live trees, right? We don't want them um, damaging those and actually killing trees. So there's kind of a fine line there between are they beneficial or are they not? But they can be still useful. Um, so, and they also are food for a lot of other organisms. So um, there are different creatures, mammals, that will eat termites too. So again, they've got a useful purpose. And that brings me to lots of different insects are useful because they are food for other things. And so here you can see this bluebird um, has a couple of different caterpillars in its beak because it's taking them back to feed its young. And so the insects are super important to make sure that other creatures have enough food to survive. If they didn't, if those insects didn't exist, we wouldn't have bluebirds and a lot of the other songbirds that feed on insects. And then they make awesome, useful products for us. I don't know about you, but I love honey. It's a great sweetener, yummy. And so that is another product that they make for us. And finally, the last one that they make for us is maybe some of you have used these in your classroom. And these are silk moths. Silk moths are actually where we get silk from. So if you have a silk scarf or a silk sweater or a silk shirt, these are the insects that are making those. So they are super useful and do a ton of different things for us. So that's a few of the useful ones. Now I'm going to show you some really unusual ones. So some of my favorite are the strangest looking things on the planet, I think. And so this is a leaf insect, and this is a young one. So remember we said, which kind of metamorphosis would this be? This is a little one. This is a big one. Anyone want to answer that? You have two choices. Remember the two types of metamorphosis, Ooh. either complete or incomplete. Anyone want to answer? Ms. Darcy's class, fourth graders, what do we think? Incomplete. Yes, very Please. good. Incomplete, because this little one looks an awful lot like this big one, right? So they look similar. So this is an incomplete metamorphosis where they just kind of get bigger and bigger and bigger. This is a stick insect, very, very large. This is one that I actually was pretty proud of myself because they're very hard to find in the wild because they look like a stick and they don't move very much. Um, but I was able to find this one in Australia um, in this kind of garden area um, that we were hiking in. And then this one up here is actually not an insect. It is an arthropod. It is a whip scorpion. 
Um, and this was actually a pet of mine. I had this one um, until unfortunately it passed away um, from old age, but this was Vinny and Vinny is a whip scorpion. Looks very unusual, looks very scary. This is definitely one that when I was younger, I'd been like, no way, no thank you, no how. Um, but I love this creature now. I've realized that it looks scary, but it doesn't want to hurt me at all. It has no interest in me. I am big and scary to it. These pinchers are used just for this to capture its food and to hold on to it while it can eat it. Um, so it doesn't want to use those to pinch me. It really doesn't want to use those as a defense mechanism. And I should have got a different picture that showed its tail, but it's got this kind of pointy whip looking tail. It's just very narrow and straight. It's not one that has a stinger on the end. Um, and its only mechanism to protect itself is to shoot what's called acetic acid. That sounds scary, but it's a chemistry that we all eat. It's vinegar. So if you have vinegar and oil on your salad or on your sandwich, you're eating vinegar. And so basically it shoots vinegar. That's the only mechanism that this creature has to protect itself. And so knowing that I'm like, okay, it's not that scary. And so um, I've ha I had to over time develop a bit of a, what should I say, confidence in myself that, you know what, this thing is pretty cool. It does a lot of cool things and not many people get to see them. Um, so that's also pretty cool. And then there are the destructive ones. We have insects that are eating our food supply. We have insects that are chewing up wood like these termites. You're getting a termite lesson apparently here. I didn't realize that I had so many termite examples, but they're a great example because you see this, this is wood and they have made all these tunnels and holes and eventually they will eat all of that. And that's no good. This here is actually um, some of bird seed that I had in the garage and these weevils got into it and so these little gray things are all weevils and they've like made a mess out of my bird seed and so um, they can be super destructive they eat our plants that are growing our crops they can eat our houses they eat us right they can transmit diseases in some cases so there are definitely some things that we need to understand and figure out how do we protect those that are beneficial but then control those that are damaging things that are important to us right or important to our environment. Oh. And then there are the real life zombies. And these are incredible. So there are things called parasitoids. And those are typically wasps that will come along and they'll lay their egg on a poor unsuspecting caterpillar. So this right here is caterpillar. All these little white things are the cocoons that are holding the pupa of a tiny, tiny little wasp. And that little wasp will emerge and mate and then find another caterpillar and lay its eggs on that caterpillar and then eat that caterpillar. So these are real life zombies. They basically lay an egg and then take over this caterpillar as basically a food source. And then they emerge and the whole cycle starts again. And so they are. there are some real life zombies out there in the insect world. And then they're also amazing architects. So this here is a termite mound that is probably taller than me. So I'm five, five, so it's probably six foot tall. And these are great, amazing architects because they've built this. And what it does is it allows the whole colony to adjust temperature inside there and to keep the environment the way that they need it and want it regardless of what the temperature is outside. So amazing architects too. Um, I should have put a honeycomb on here. If you've ever looked at a honeycomb, that is another amazing architectural design. And bees do that all the time. They make those perfect little hexagons that are just stunning and beautiful. And you think like they don't have a way to measure things. How do they get it just so and just right? Um, so they're really good architects. So I know there's a lot of words on this slide and I've said a lot of these things already, but I want to just make sure that you understand why should we even study insects? What are they good for? One is they are super important pollinators for all of our plants, which produce our food. And so if we didn't have insects, a lot of the food that we have, we wouldn't have. Um, so if you like strawberries, if you, my favorite example is chocolate. I am a big fan of chocolate. We would not have chocolate if it wasn't for a teeny tiny little fly called a midge. 
And that midge is what pollinates cacao. And cacao is the crop that we harvest to make chocolate. So it all starts with that teeny tiny little fly making that chocolate bar that I love so much possible. And so really it's, I think the statistic is every, for every three bites of food that we can thank pollinators, something along those lines, it's a lot of food that we uh, can thank pollinators for because um, most of them need an insect pollinator. Then we have to, you know, protect our crops. Like I said, there are pests um, that want to eat our crops. And so we need to protect them from those kinds of insects. Some are household pests. We talked a little bit about those as well. Some are vectors of disease, which means that when that mosquito bites you, sometimes it can actually um, insert a disease also in there. So it's not the insect itself, but the insect carries the disease, right? Um, and so because it can transmit that, that means that they're um, a problem that we need to consider and look at and figure out how do we control. And then there's biological control. We can use good bugs against bad bugs. And so that helps us balance that nature. Um, and they're an important part of the food supply and the food chain. So animals eat them like that bluebird that I showed on that slide, but also some humans um, around the world will eat insects and they're a great source of protein. And they don't taste that bad either. So I've had some and they're not that bad. Um, and then they also produce the useful things, right? That we talked about. And they're also just super cool. They're so diverse, like this rhinoceros beetle that you see here, um, or Hercules beetle, sorry. This is Hercules beetle um, here that you see. They're just super unique and cool and interesting body plans. They live in interesting environments. Basically, they live anywhere on the planet except for the oceans. So even in Antarctica, you can find an insect. So amazing that they're able to kind of diversify that much to live in all sorts of different environments from the trees to the ground, you name it, they are everywhere. So I'm going to give you some ideas of things that you can do to enjoy insects. You can, like Jesse said at the beginning of this, you can go on an insect safari in your neighborhood. Just take a look around on the sidewalk and the trees, um, dig a little in the ground and see what you can find. Um, and you, you can document those. You can take a notebook and you can write kind of what it looks like and then look it up and see if you can determine what kind of insect you found. You can build a solitary bee house. That's what's shown here in this picture. So you can actually, these happen to be bamboo, um, but you can just collect a bunch of sticks and, and rubber band them together and insects will find those and use those too. Hang them um, in a tree somewhere and insects will use those and find those as well. You can plant native flowers. Bees and butterflies need nectar to survive and they need plants to, for their young to grow on. And so if you plant native flowers, you can often find the caterpillars and the butterflies, the adults, um, both on your plant. You can create your own insect collection. So as part of an entomologist, every entomologist has to have an insect collection as we're going through school. And so you collect them and you describe them and you observe what they, the characteristics are. And eventually you know how to classify them into certain groups. And then you can just observe insect behavior. So sit on the ground and stare at a, a little patch for a little bit and see what walks by, see where it goes. Is it carrying anything? I love to do this with ant colonies because ants are just amazing to me. And so watch and see which ones are carrying something that looks like three times its size back are they following the same path? How many are you seeing? Um, all of those questions make you a really good start at being an entomologist. And then another activity you could do, maybe those of you that are uh, teachers might wanna take this one and do in your classroom, you can build your own insect. So we've talked a little bit about the types of mouth parts, but another thing, they all have six legs. If you didn't already know that, they have six legs and three body parts. That's a general characteristic of what an insect is. So you can build your own insect, name your own insect. Actually, did you know if you discover a new insect, which people are doing all the time, they go out and they collect from random spots and they find new insects that have never been described before. If you find a brand new one, you get to name it whatever you want. So that's a pretty cool little perk. Um, but you can try, kind of write a little story about it. Where does it live? What does it eat? What adventures does it have? Where does it go? Does it interact with other insects in a positive or negative way? Um, so you can kind of design your own insect and tell me what it might do. That would be fun to see. And if you do, please let Jesse and I know. We'd love to see those adventures and what those look like. Please so please. that's all I have. I know I talked a lot, but uh, I was, I'm super excited about bugs.
we can tell. Rhonda, yes. that was so much fun. Thank you so, so much. If you want to come out of screen share so you can see us have a bit of a conversation, that would be lovely. Um, what we're going to do is dive in with our Kahoot, test some understanding, have a little bit of fun, uh, and then we're going to go to Q&A with all our classes. So uh, if you're new to Kahoot, the faster you answer, the more points you get, and what you win is Dr. Ham and I's everlasting respect. So that's worth quite a bit. Uh, the Hopefully you guys get your answers in quickly. If you're on YouTube, make sure to get in really quick because it's a little bit delayed for you. But we're going to get underway with our almost 50 Kahoot players in just a second. Here we go. And then I'm going to head to Mrs. Darcy's class first uh, in South Jordan once we get underway with our Q&A. Uh, let's do this thing, everybody, and uh, dive in. I hope a bug name wins this. I always like when thematic names win the Kahoots. It's childish, but that's I'm childish, so there you go. All right. Quiz. There are 6,000 kinds of mammals. So things with fur, things with hair, like us, mice, antelope, all that good stuff. How many kinds of insect are there? 6,000, 2, 10,000, 50,000, or over a million? What do we think? We talked about a lot of different kinds of insect in the talk today. One of them, a million seems too high, maybe. I don't know. Maybe it, maybe, maybe so. But we also mentioned that we find new ones every time we look. Uh, keep that in mind. The answer is over a million. Yes. And most of you got this right. There's so many insects. It's crazy, Rhonda. Yeah. So, and that's really just all that's been described. There's estimated yeah. to be well over that many. Which is so exciting. We think there are between two and about 30 million species that are, but every time we go look, we discover more and uh, insects are the bulk of that. So very cool. All right. These monuments were made by insects. I put this in before I saw the talk, because I just think they're super cool. So I hope you all get this right. We saw things like this in the program. These are amazing. I, I've actually seen big termite mounds in the world and like nothing quite that large, nothing quite as large as the one Ron just set off, but they are magnificent to see. And there's not just like one, in many places there'll be like thousands and thousands of these. They look like trees almost all over the landscape, which is wild. Very cool. All right, Rocky Raccoon takes our lead. What a funny name. Um, of all things, uh, true or false number three, some ants farm aphids like cows. So like ants are like farmers. They got the little cap and everything and they go around and they farm aphids and maybe drink something that they produce. I'll give you a hint. It's in the picture. <laughs> spoilers, spoilers. Yeah. You kids are like on the ball. I think we've got 78 answers so far. This is our biggest kahoot of the if then series. This is so exciting. Yes, it is true. So some ants are farmers, which is Wow, they'll have these like whole little herds that they move around and protect from predators and keep them around and uh, drink their droppings, which is kind of gross. And, 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 and that is one of the first things that I studied, actually, is that interaction between ants oh, and a, what's called a scale insect that produces that honeydew. So similar to those aphids. Very, very cool. All right, our final question for all the marbles. This is multi-select, which means there's more than one right answer. So click whatever you think is real. Is a centipede that hunts bats real? Are ants with underground nests as big as human houses real? Are spiders that fly around the world on silk strands real? Or are scorpions that glow in ultraviolet light real? So some of these, maybe all of them, are real. You have to pick which ones. And you've got four seconds left. Don't be shy. Get as many in as you can. Ooh, we trip people up with this one. It is all of them. Yes, I, it's always all of them when it's me. So all of those things are real. They're ridiculous. If you want more info on any of those, I will happily share. But let's see what our leaderboard is, Rhonda, before we go to Miss Darcy's class. If you are any of these people, let us know who you are in the chat. Focus Dingo is third. Drum roll. Bum, 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 bum. Decisive Buffalo was very decisive indeed. And number one, is it Rocky Raccoon? It's Amazing Goat. We really mess people up with that final question. We changed the leaderboard radically. That's exciting. Well, thank you for playing along, everybody. <laughs> uh, and we're going to head to Utah. Come on in, fourth graders, and take us away with our first question. Yeah. Hey. Come up and stand up here quickly. Take your time. You're Ask your question. What's the most interesting thing about bees? Ooh, Ooh that's a good question. Um, so I think some, so a lot of people like bees, like honeybees, because they produce honey. Um, but my answer is going to be um, there is this whole group of solitary bees, they live alone. And I don't think most people know that. So one of my most interesting things about bees is that there are solitary bees. That's actually, remember that house that I showed you with all the bamboo things? Yeah. Those are actually solitary bees um, that are inside those little like holes. So when they looked covered over with like a little cap and looked filled with dirt, um, those were actually filled 
by a mother bee leaving an egg in there. So she le left a little pollen ball in there for the baby bees to eat. And then when it pupates and becomes an adult bee, it'll chew its way out and fly away. Um, and so solitary bees are probably one of the coolest things. And um, maybe not your typical answer, um, like no. you know a lot about honeybees, right? Because people hear about those in the news, but um, we have an awful lot of native bees, um, yeah. which are solitary. Fantastic. I'm so glad you talked about them, actually, because they're not mentioned very often. And I am I want to make sure we get lots of kid questions, but I want to encourage people to check out my answer to that, which is the waggle dance, which is one of the coolest things in all of nature. And everyone should look up a waggle dance when we're done. We'll talk about that another time, but we're going to head to our Oxnard group, our California crew. Uh, Miss Ross, come on in. Hey. Do mantises fly? Ooh, do mantises fly? Yes. So praying mantises can fly as adults. So if you remember that metamorphosis cycle of incomplete metamorphosis, they look a lot alike when they're little and they're big. So the little ones before they're an adult cannot fly. They do not have wings but the adults develop wings and can fly. I've uh, made a mantis mad and it has flown at me. And I got to tell you that that is an unsettling thing to fly at you with its arms out. It's quite creepy actually. Yep. Um, <laughs> Georgetown, Mr. Hancock's class, we're gonna head to you guys and then Mr. Shattuck coming to you. We're gonna get two rounds, so stay tuned everyone. YouTubers, I'm coming to you as well. Mr. Hancock, hey. Oh, your audio's off for some reason. I don't know why. You were on mere seconds ago. Play with it. Play with it. Worst case, put it in the chat. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Shattuck, I'll come to you while we're waiting. Hey. What's the biggest bug you've ever found? Ooh, oh, so the biggest in terms of length is probably that one that I showed you on my arm that was the stick insect. But the biggest in terms of heaviest um, that I've ever found is probably a rhinoceros beetle um so it's big and heavy they're so cool i love and it they have these amazing like they're they call rhinoceros because they have horns <laughs> they're so cool uh anyone who gets a chance to see them maybe at a bug zoo or an actual zoo is more likely probably in the wild for a lot of you so do check them out if you get the chance mr hancock i'm going to bring you in just so we have you on camera uh what where do insects go during the winter what do they do this is like the, my fundamental insect question and i love it <laughs> Yeah, so um, depends is my answer. So insects are super diverse. And so I'm going to give you a few examples, but maybe not all of them, um, because there's a wide variety of different ways that they survive the winter. So some of them do what we call overwintering. So they will actually just hunker down either in the soil or leaf litter and wait out the summer. And when it warms up, those are the first insects that you see emerge. Um, and so those very first things that you see. Um, some are just super far down in the ground and they'll stay there. So ant colonies, for example, will maybe hunker down. Um, some of them die off for the winter. Um, and then, you know, their eggs are somewhere they'll hatch and those, that'll be the next generation. Some of them like to hide inside. So they will find the cracks and crevices. Many of you might have seen stink bugs in your house during the winter, um, and wonder like, where did that come from? So they will hide in warmer places, um, and just stay there until, the, the weather warms up again. Um, and then even others migrate. So monarchs will fly south and they will be in the hundreds of thousands in trees. Nice. They like eucalyptus trees. Um, so if you're in Southern California or Mexico, that's really where they like to overwinter. And so they stay in those warmer climates. And then once that weather kind of warms up again, they will start their migration path um, back up north to Canada. And so that's not the same generation that'll make it there. Nope. It takes four generations um, for them to kind of do that migration path. Um, so it's not the same insect that goes north that comes back south. It's a different insect. Um, it's relatives of those. Um, so lots of different ways that insects use to overwinter and survive winter. Beautiful answer. Thank you for covering all the nuance. And if you're keen on monarchs, we've done many programs on that. You can check them out on our YouTube channel as well. Uh, Ron, we're going to do a rapid fire round, as many questions as we can in the next five minutes together. I'm going to take a quick, short. quick one from YouTube, and then we're going to go to Miss Darcy's class for a second one. Uh, Miss Tomas joining us in Alaska. Welcome in, folks. They want to know, what do you study in school to become a bug expert at this age, maybe, and then in general? <laughs> yeah, so there are entomology departments. Look for an entomology department if that's what you love. If there's not an entomology department at the university you want to go to, Typically people study biology and then they specialize in insects um, and use them in whatever ways that they want. Like 
genetics or um, conservation or whatever. So. Yeah. Fantastic. I will note too, Ron, I'm sure you're uh, willing to do this and we'll see how it goes, but if classes want to email more questions, I can get you some answers and Ron will be happy to follow up if you have any more questions that we can possibly take today. So please do send them to me via email. Miss Darcy, we're going to head to you guys live. Come on in. Hey. Are there any types of bugs that eat reptiles or mammals? Yes. Ooh, are there any? Well, so um, mosquitoes eat mammals because they're eating us, right? So they bite us. Um, there are things called lice that will get on birds and poultry and um, such. I have seen some pictures of praying mantises eating some small birds and such. Um, so there are a few. They're, they're usually on the, the mammal eating them. So like a tick um, is another example. Again, not an insect. It's, an, it's got eight legs, so it's an arthropod, but similar. Um, and so there are things that eat on things usually don't eat the whole thing, but, and then there are some that eat the dead animals too. I'm trying to think, I mean, insects less likely. There's one that jumps to mind actually for fish, which is the giant water bug, which everyone should look up and they're yes. really freaky. And it's the freakiest thing I've ever seen live in my life. It was amazing. Um, there's also so a fishing I, spider. Yes. I was going to say spiders and centipedes will eat small mammals, fish. As I said, bat hunting centipedes is actually a thing. Um, so you can check that out. Uh, but insects, giant water bugs are a go-to option for those who are keen. It's gruesome, awesome. but it's awesome. I love it. Um, Ms. Barajas, we're coming to you. And then Mr. Shattuck will wrap up in just a minute. Come on in, Oxnard. Hey. What's your favorite animal you have seen in this video? <laughs> oh, my. So that's a trick question because I have a favorite one that I love to study. Um, and because I spent a lot of time studying it, that's the housefly. Um, so not super exciting. But my favorite one that I think is just super cool and interesting is that leaf insect that I showed you. And why I think it's so cool and it's one of my favorite insects ever is because they are camouflaged. So when you're looking for them in like the actual environment where they live, they're very hard to see because they look a lot like a leaf. And even down to like the edges, like when you look at a leaf and it's kind of brown and drying on the edges, they have that same thing on their bodies. And so that's super cool. The other thing that they do is they kind of sway. So when you're thinking about like what's, what's a branch looking like, the wind is always happening, right? And so they sway a little bit so that they look like they're a leaf blowing in the wind, which is amazing. It really is. I'm so glad we got that question. Thanks, Ms. Bras class. Mr. Chatham's class, I'm going to come to you to wrap up in a second. I just want to make a quick note. If you want to check out more, ifthenshecan.org, so much to discover. We've got six more programs in our series coming after this, so check this out. Um, it's all on our webpage, and if everything that we do is on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check out this program, share it with family and friends. Lots of opportunity to keep the learning going. Uh, we're going to head back to our Ontario Crew 5 sixes. Come on in and wrap us up. Hey. What's the coolest bug you found? Found ever. Best bug ever. Oh, the coolest one I found, or the coolest one I've ever had, because I don't know. The coolest one I've ever found was probably a carrion beetle. So these are hard to find because you have to look on dead things. Um, and it was actually not on a dead thing that I found it. Um, so that's why it was kind of cool. And so they eat, de they're helpful in decomposition. So they're eating dead things. Um, and then the, the coolest one I had was um, probably a death feigning beetle. And they are super cute and fun. They're like this light gray, beautiful color, kind of bluish gray. And they're called a death feigning beetle because when they get scared, they basically stiff it up, fall over like they're dead. <laughs> so Amazing. I love I don't know if there's a hyphen in here, but that would be how it's spelled if you want to look this up. Yeah. So very, very cool. I've never actually heard of such a thing. So Rhonda, you you stumped me, and that doesn't happen very often. So I appreciate your passion, energy, knowledge, all of this. This has been such a wild ride. Um, a big thank you to all our classes. Check out the rest of our series, uh, and go explore some bugs. Go find them right now. Skip class. Uh, don't actually skip class. Go when you're done in the school day today. Find some insects and arachnids out there. An incredibly diverse group of animals, um, and and so much fun that we had exploring a little bit of that today. So. Rhonda, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. So, Mr. Shadow's class, Mr. Ross, Mr. Darcy. Yeah. Yeah.